And I'm going to share my screen. How does that look, Tim? Yeah, it's, it's there. All good? Yeah. Excellent. All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Beck. I'm from the city of Stonington. My role is a sustainable environment officer, uh, and basically I'm here to help you all take action on climate uh, as well as promoting uh, a lot of, you know, sustainable behaviours. I wanted to start off with acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight, and for Stonington, that's the Wurundjeri and Bunurong peoples, and pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging, as well as extending that respect to any Indigenous people who might be joining us tonight. We acknowledge the living connection to country, the relationship with the land and all living things extending back thousands of years for all Indigenous people. Again, welcome to our first webinar in our Towards Zero series set for summer, the Renter's Guide to Home Energy Efficiency. We're going to be having various webinars um, on different topics over the next few months, right through until June next year. Uh, so if you're interested, make sure that you sign up for our newsletter. Uh, I'll put some of these links in the chat later on um, and you'll be kept informed about all of the things that we're running. Council declared a climate emergency in 2020 and we're committed to helping residents take action. The great thing is often when you make steps to be more sustainable, you also decrease the cost of your energy bills. And tonight we're going to be discussing easy, low cost tips that won't upset your landlord or a property manager. A little bit of housekeeping for tonight. Uh, we're going to be recording so we can watch back at any time. Uh, please mute yourself though so we don't get any interruptions during our presentation. And feel free to ask questions in the chat box. And at the end, I'm also going to send out um, a survey because we love to hear your feedback um, and any other ideas that you might have for the future. I'm going to have a little bit of a chat about our Towards Zero Home Energy Efficiency Kits. So these are relatively new. I think they went into libraries at the start of this financial year. Um, and we have them available to all library members, all Stonington library members. There's eight in total, so two at each library, and they contain three sort of important pieces of, um, three important tools in the kit, I should say. So on the left is the thermal imaging camera. In the middle is a power, mate, power monitoring device. And on the right is the thermometer. There's a little bit of a queue at the moment to borrow these, uh, but I suggest popping your name down now and you'll have a, them as soon as they're available. I'll pop the link for that in the chat in a minute as well. One of the uh, devices is the PowerMate. So this can be plugged in um, to any of your appliances and it can tell you the cost to run them per hour. Uh, I think it talks about greenhouse gas emissions. There's a few little different things and they're great for smaller appliances. So toasters and kettles and, you know, plug-in heaters, that sort of thing. But they, they don't really work for built-in appliances. Um, for those, you'll need a PowerPal device, which is the... Um, this thing over here on the right hand side and that's currently free by the state government they've subsidized it um, they did appear on one of the first uh, episodes of the war on waste and basically this little device here connects up to your smart meter um, and there's an app which provides you with um, real data as you're using power which is really great the other piece which is probably the most exciting tool in the kit is the thermal imaging camera so it's really useful for spotting gaps in insulation, uh, leaks around doors and windows and floorboards, that sort of thing. Um, and it works really well if you have either like a very hot or a very cold day and the inside temperature is like much more pleasant because you can see the difference uh, in the two temperatures. So you're thinking this is great, but how exactly do I use this? So each kit also comes with its own manual. Uh, there's eight different efficiency tests that you can complete along with tips and an action plan uh, for your next steps, which is really helpful. So now I've spruiked uh, our home energy efficiency kits enough, I will pass over to our speaker for tonight, Tim. Tim is a specialist home energy assessor who lives in Melbourne. He's advised thousands of people on how they can save money, increase the efficiency of their home, and most importantly, the comfort of their homes. 
He's a public speaker. He writes articles for well-known sustainability magazines. He's just told me that he's about to write a book, which is very exciting, uh, and also is the creator of the ever-growing My Efficient Electric Home. Did I say that right, or is it My yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> home, yeah. My Efficient Electric Home Facebook page? So, Tim, I will pass over to you, and I will stop sharing. Very good. Well, uh, welcome to everybody, and. Um... And I guess you're saying you're also recording this, so who knows when when somebody might have a look at this. Um, yeah, I've got some slides. I'll go through them, I suppose, fairly quickly. And um, a key thing, uh, I guess, for the audience members is, yeah, just uh, just be writing down your questions or thinking about what your questions might be, or maybe some of the slides will will uh, jog some questions, and we'll make sure we get get through those. Um, so I'll try and share the screen here. And uh, mm, no, that maybe that didn't work. There we go. That looks better. And there's some slides actually start at the start. Okay, yeah. here we go. Thanks, um, yeah, and so, um, you know, one of the things that there's, there's various resources out there. So in, in addition to just what you might hear tonight, but if you Google, you know, home comfort and energy and renters and what can renters do, you'll find some resources. This one here uh, on the left there from Renew Magazine, I was just checking the date, that's 2016. So 2016, I, um, they did an article. So I went into a home and we we looked at various things. And so they, they wrote an article there for Renew Magazine. A lot of the Renew, Renew Magazine stuff is available online um, for everybody. There's even more online for members and you can find the magazine often in libraries. So that's Renew Magazine with a lot of tips. I'll talk about them a bit more later. And uh, I just needed to put something on the first slide here. So another another source um, of information for folks is from the uh, crowd called Better Renting. You see that down the bottom there, Better Renting. That's what uh, that's who put together this other energy efficiency guide. But Environment Victoria and some others and have uh, over the years put together some tips for renters. Um, this is what I'll go through tonight. Um, the information sources, space heating, um, uh, hot water, cooking, monitoring the energy use, your electricity use you already mentioned a bit with the uh, with the devices there, insulation, draft proofing, moisture management, window coverings and shower heads uh, is what's on the agenda. But yeah, for the audience, questions about whatever in the home with respect to health, comfort, energy bills, happy to try to help. A um, yeah, key resource for people who are on Facebook anyway is this Facebook group that I started. Uh, well, we're into our ninth year now. So I guess it's more than eight years ago we started this group. And it's got 105,000 members with well, it could be 100, 200 uh, more people coming in every day. Um, so it, uh, you know, a year ago, it, the size of it doubles every year. A year ago, it had 50,000. Don't know if next year we'll have 200,000, but um, it's a Facebook group, if you're familiar with those. Um, yeah, there's a bit of a running chat goes goes on. Someone will come in and, and ask a question. Uh, but chances are it's a question that's been asked 100 times before. That's fine. Uh, they'll get some answers, but it's also a searchable database. So um, if there's one particular brand, End of equipment like that power pal was mentioned if you want to see what people are saying about power pal you type um you know that into the search function and uh, it's really a searchable database i think it's probably the world's largest database on this this whole topic because we get 50 posts a day thousands of comments every day so there's a huge amount of information there's been piling up over the last eight years but not everybody's on facebook but for those that are it could be useful um Let's see. Uh, and um, other information sources, I mentioned Renew, renew.org.au, Stonington Council, of course, I found uh, your sustainability part there um, that has some information. Uh, better Renting, I mentioned. Uh, Green It Yourself. Now, that's a place, and we'll talk about things like draft proofing later, and there may be some draft proofing things you can do that's not going to upset the um, the landlord or the property manager. So there's videos out there, at, uh, for example, Green It Yourself. That uh, was put together by a former ABC television show, Carbon Cop, Lish, Lish Fayer. She still works with the ABC. And uh, Ecomaster, um, that's Lynn and Morris being at up in Gisborne. And for years, they've been doing the draft proofing and insulating thing. And they've 
taken all their, you know, so-called intellectual property, you might say, and made all these videos and put them up on the internet. So all very, lots of useful information. And um, another website, energytips.org.au, that was, this was put together by Geelong Sustainability. And uh, it's got a really good interactive website there. You click on something like heating or whatever. And again, you might end up with some EcoMaster videos, but uh, yeah, a lot of good information they put together. I mean, that's just a handful. There's, there's tons of stuff out there. Um, so let's talk about heating first. <clears throat> and, um, you know, so uh, I've been I've been in a lot of rental properties. Um, you know, my, my daughter's in a rental property right now. And um, often, even, uh, you know, often renters will have even choices about how they might heat the place. And the, the three main options is there might be a gas heater, or there might be uh, those re resistive electric panel heaters, or there might be a reverse cycle air conditioner. Uh, that's the case at my daughter's place. There's a gas heater there. There's a reverse cycle air conditioner. And if she wanted, she could drag in a uh, her own resistive electric heater and plug it in. So which is the, which is the best thing to do? And the key message is heat with your reverse cycle air conditioner. Uh, it can be a third the cost of gas. It can be a fourth or a fifth the cost of using the electric heater. Uh, and this is <clears throat> this is pretty amazing news for a lot of people. Um, for years, we've kind of demonized air conditioners and said, oh, my God, don't turn on the air conditioner. It will cost the earth to run it. Um, yeah, don't, don't use it in the summer. I don't care. But uh, in winter, it's by far your cheapest way to heat because it's a heat pump. Now, what's a what's a heat pump? Um, oh, well, this just this just brings up an article from The Age. You can Google my name. You'll find find a lot of this stuff. Uh, this article from The Age was more than five years ago. This was 2015. This was when we published the research out of the University of Melbourne. We found that it was so much cheaper to heat with, with the reverse cycle air conditioner. And I've been telling people that ever since. And even, even authorities like the Victorian government have caught on to this. And um, they have even declared that starting next year, new homes won't be connected to gas, to the gas grid at all. And a key thing that makes that possible is the uh, the reverse cycle air conditioner for heating, also the induction cooktop for cooking. We'll talk about that later. But uh, yeah, everybody around the world is starting to realize now that heat pumps are the way to go. Uh, certainly in Europe, heat pumps are absolutely enormous right now because uh, they want to get off Russian gas. So even in colder climates than what we have, um, these these heat pumps will work. Um, now they can come in various forms. And um, we're all fairly familiar with the uh, split system up on the wall, but uh, all these things are just different ways that uh, heat pumps can be set up. And of course there can be ducted system as well, systems as well, where um, you've got a ducted system. And if there's no gas connected to that ducted system and it heats and cools, well, it must be a, a reverse cycle air conditioner. So there, there's just various different forms of them that you could see. Uh, it comes with an inside unit and an outside unit. And this is the way that a heat pump works. The uh, when when you put this on heating mode, it uses a refrigerant system that goes around and around, and it actually that refrigerant goes outside even on a cold day and is is able to collect heat out of the environment. And then uh, the refrigerant goes through a compressor, gets really hot, comes into the inside unit, and the fan blows off the heat, which cools the refrigerant. The refrigerant goes back outside again. Um, goes through an expansion valve, expands, gets really cold. So the refrigerant might be like minus 30 degrees going around this thing when it's outside. And that's why if you have a fan blowing, even cold winter air, it might be four degrees outside, but there's plenty of heat in that air still that will just soak into the very cold refrigerant. And then the refrigerant goes to the compressor and gets hot and comes inside and the cycle goes over again. So the reason why these are so cheap is because most of the heat you're using, you've got for free. Uh, out of the environment. Yes, you do have to put some electricity in it to run the fans and the compressor. But for every one unit of, of electricity going in, you'll probably get like four units of heat coming out of it. So in this way, you could say it's 400% efficient. And that beats, um, it beats an electric resistive panel heater, which, you know, it might be 100% efficient, you put one unit of electricity in, you get a unit of electric of heat coming out. That's great, 100% efficient, but it can't compete with a heat pump that's 400% efficient. And gas is even a lot less efficient than that because when you buy gas, the first thing you do is set it on fire and a good part of the heat goes up the chimney. So the gas industry can't compete with these things anymore. Um, get onto it. Now, if you're in a rental and it doesn't have one of these, 
Um, there's there's certainly, um, and maybe we'll talk about this more in the questions, etc. But it, it is it is recognized by the governments and others that you do have this so-called split incentive that you know the tenant may have lots of reasons to uh, have a reverse cycle air conditioner, but the landlord just doesn't want to do it. Um, as I understand it, the, the Victorian government did pass some rules recently that there needs to be a fixed fixed heating in, in a place that's rented out. And uh, so I would hope that uh, they're mostly going to be reverse cycle air conditioners in the future. Um, people need summer cooling. So uh, of course, these things, uh, you can cool your house with them in the summer but it's a, a wonderful unit that in the wintertime will give you the cheapest heat. So you could have a good reason to, you know, if you don't have a reverse cycle air conditioner to lobby the landlord and say, Hey, I need some summer cooling. And by the way, we'll get some, um, you know, the cheapest heat as well. The landlord, um, it has been mentioned in federal parliament. Uh, some of the independent MPs like the idea that the landlord should get like immediate tax write-off for, for making this sort of switch. So that would be one way to incentivize landlords. And there had been some other rebates and incentives available to try to reduce the cost of these things um, for people bringing them into a property or bringing them in and getting rid of the gas heater. The um, I'll probably talk about gas heaters later. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, there's some gas heaters. Um, you know, the thing about gas heaters is you got to make sure they don't kill you. Uh, they can produce carbon monoxide and bring that into your air that you breathe. And carbon monoxide is colorless and odorless and hangs around in the air. Um, so it can kill you. And people in Victoria have died. And so officially, the gas equipment, landlords should be uh, be having the gas equipment checked not less than every two years to make sure it's not putting out poisonous carbon monoxide. And so that's another cost. That's another cost for someone to come around and check the gas heaters. Look, everybody just be better off if uh, they were permanently shut off and uh, and places had reverse cycle air conditioners instead. No one needs to come around and check if your reverse cycle air conditioner is going to kill you. Um, so that, that's a bit of an incentive there not to, to have the gas. Um, getting back to this. Uh, yeah, this we can compare the heating with the reverse cycle air conditioner, the so-called heat pump. Uh, with the electric heaters, the electric heaters are going to be a lot more costly. Um, but that said, um, if you had a rental and you had a reverse cycle air conditioner doing most of the heating, but if you wanted to have an electric heater in the bathroom just to warm that a little bit when you're doing a shower, or if you have another room that you know maybe doesn't get used all the time, but a little bit of heat in there would be a good idea, uh, you can use the electric heaters, but You'd want to be, you know, having that that power mate device that was mentioned before, the power pal, to just make sure you understand how much electricity is going into an electric heater, so that you don't get a big surprise with the electricity bill. So in this, in our house, we're in a freestanding home, and we've got two reverse cycles downstairs. But up here in this bedroom, yeah, there's no heating or cooling here except for the electric panel heater I've got under the desk, which gets turned on for just a few hours each winter. Um, I haven't gotten around to spending another couple thousand dollars for a reverse cycle air conditioner for another room because um, I know that I don't use the electric heater that much and it's not going to uh, run up a big electricity bill. So just be careful with those things if you're going to going to use them and make sure you understand how much electricity they might be using. Um, back to the air cons. If you do have an air con, well, uh, there'll be a filter inside it. You just flip open the you know, for normal split system, you just flip open the plastic panel on the front and uh, you'll find a filter in there, which uh, is taking some dust out of the air, mostly to protect the heat exchanger that's behind there. Um, but it also takes some dust out of the air, which is nice. It means you don't have to breathe that dust. But uh, keep an eye on the filters. People say, how often should I clean them? It can be DIY to clean them. Um, the Probably the biggest trick is if you know if they're pretty high up on the wall then you might be, need a ladder and so there's safety issues concerned with that but often it's diy to clean the filters um gently pick them up and and slide them out of the machine vacuum them off soak them in in a sink with some uh clothing detergent for a little while uh gently wipe them off with the rag air dry them and put them back in and you're ready to go again um if you're ready to go again, you could look at the heat exchanger that's behind it and make sure it doesn't look filthy and gunky. If it did, 
if the heat exchanger behind looks like particularly it's gotten cooking grease or that sort of thing in there, or maybe there were smokers and previously renting a place or a long time back, you know, you should probably have an air conditioner cleaned about every five years or so. Um, so you could look at the heat exchanger. And if that looks particularly filthy, then you could lobby the property property manager to get a, a professional cleaner in there to clean the, uh, the air conditioner. That should be done. Like I said, maybe, maybe every, every five years or so, depending on how it's being looked after. You know, if someone's looked after the filters really well, then the heat exchanger will be cleaner. And if, um, you know, if there's not a lot of cooking grease near the air conditioner, then then it shouldn't, uh, you know, be getting any cooking grease into it. So uh, every, you know, every piece of equipment is probably going to require some sort of maintenance. Uh, try to understand what you've got there and how to how to keep it going. So I guess people will ask me, how often do you clean the filters? And I say, whenever they get dirty. So, um, you know, if you're using it as your main source of heating, you'll be using it every day. So check it after a month and, you know, see if there's any dirt building up in there. And after a while, you develop a uh, an idea of what the cleaning schedule should be. Uh, radio. Yeah, this was just a bit about uh, the carbon monoxide and checking gas heaters, not less than every couple of years. But uh, a main message that it's just a lot, it's just a lot cheaper to be using a reverse cycle air conditioner, like a third the cost of um, what you get with the gas heating. And that's what we're finding in thousands and thousands of homes all around the country. You know, uh, as we can see from the Facebook group, My Efficient Electric Home, a lot of people saving a lot of money by not burning gas. And um, just by the way, um, I keep an eye on these things. Gas sales were way down in the last quarter in the in the quarter ending the 30th of September. It was a bit of a warmer winter, but um, people are getting off the gas at home and that's going to have an impact to reduce the amount of gas that we use in Victoria. Victoria used to have cheap gas and it's kind of ironic. I actually migrated from America to Australia to work in the gas industry. And now I tell people don't use this stuff because we've got cheaper options. Um, most of the cheap Victorian gas came out of the the Bass Strait with the offshore oil and gas platforms out there. And we told people that would only last about 50 years and we're coming to the end of that. So um, the end, you know, we, we don't have any more cheap gas around. The price of gas has gone up quite dramatically. And uh, so it'd be good not to be able to use it. Could save a bit of money that way. Uh, yeah, here's more, you know, people talking about the all electric home. And if you could manage it in a rental that you're not using any gas, then you don't need to get a gas bill. Um, you probably pay like a dollar a day to be connected. And if you could find a way out of that, you'd save some money. And that's what a lot of people are doing. Um, what do we got? We got hot water now. There may be not a lot you can do with respect to the hot water in a rental other than understand, you know, what is it that is heating the water? Is it gas or is it... Um, electric resistive or is it a heat pump possibly this is what a heat pump hot water can work look like same sort of technology it's a heat pump like the reverse cycle air conditioner it gets free heat out of the air and puts it in the water um, you could have a look at the date of your existing water heater if you know where it's at and if it's um you know if it's over 10 years old or whatever if you ever had the opportunity, you can have a conversation with the property manager or landlord about replacing it with a heat pump. This is what the government is supporting. There are a lot of rebates and incentives available to make it so that a hot water heat pump isn't that expensive and it's a lot cheaper than you know replacing a gas heater with another gas heater. So um, yeah, it'd be a shame if, you're, if your hot water service is gas and it fails and and you let them know and they come and replace it. Of course, they may just put another gas heater in there, which would be pretty stupid for everybody. But that it's still happening. Of course, we still need to spread the word a lot more. So the more people that are that are educated, this sort of thing, the better. Um, for example, I went to an electrification expo in Hawthorne a few weeks ago, organized by the community group Electrify Burundara. And they had something like 1,200 people show up there. So a lot of people very interested in not having to use the gas anymore. Um, cooking, radio. So um, yeah, the thing about the cooking is to not use the gas heating. Um, an option could be a portable induction cooktop. And if you were to get on the Facebook group, for example, and, and type in the search function portable induction, you'll see a whole bunch of different creative ways that people have come up with to not use the gas where rather to uh, get hold of one of these like $75 portable induction cooktops from Ikea and off, off you go. I was in a um, Asian hot pot restaurant in Melbourne and, and every table 
in the restaurant, everybody had their own portable induction. So we're certainly going to be seeing more of these. And so what you can possibly do is if you've got a gas cooktop is to figure out a way to make sure the gas isn't going to turn on. But then these portable inductions can be just plugged into the wall. And there you go. No more gas cooking. Um, you're on to heating with the induction. And if that allows the whole property to get off gas, then you don't need to get a gas bill anymore. But this comes with some pretty significant health benefits. Something like 12% of childhood asthma has been linked to gas cooking in the home. Hopefully you've got a good extraction fan. So with any type of cooking, run the extraction fan. Hopefully it takes the, you know, the air to the outside of the property. Sometimes they just recirculate around, but in either case, keep the, the filters clean. Um, so even if it's recirculating, it might be removing something. But uh, open windows nearby, that always helps an extraction fan to to work better and get the contaminants out of the house, whether they be, you know, just your, your, your usual cooking contaminants, um, but also the other chemicals that you get when you're burning gas. So it's the it's the nitrous oxide that seems to be the main thing that uh, inflames asthma. But there's plenty of other um, pollutants coming off the gas cooking. And these days we, you know, we're all trying to be a bit healthier. Um, far fewer of us smoke than we used to. We don't have leaded petrol anymore. So we're you know, basically trying to clean up the joint. And um, yeah, so getting getting gas cooking out of the home, that's uh, that's going to be the thing as well. And um, so Rebecca, you wanted to mention something about loaning out uh, induction cooktops maybe. Yeah, so um, we're currently in the process of working through uh, getting some of these portable induction cooktops available in local libraries. So similar to like what I spoke about at the start of the presentation, the home energy efficiency kits, um, these will be similar. They'll be in um, like a case and you'll be able to borrow them from your local library, take it home and trial it for free, basically. See how you like it. There's a lot of people who have never used induction cooking before. Um so yeah, you can have a go before you sort of have any commitments. Then if you like it, you can either buy your own portable one or, you know, potentially down the track, if you move into your own home, you know, that sort of thing, look at installing one as well. So we'll look, uh, there's a bit of a process. So potentially looking at having them in libraries sometime next year, hopefully early next year, but watch this space. Yeah, the um, Glen Ira Council had me in for an event the other day. They actually had the crowd open table came in to cook a few things, um, but they were doing it right there in the, uh, you know, in the meeting room on the induction, the portable induction cooktops that they brought in. And uh, yeah, a lot of people had questions about the induction. And then I was also there just to answer other questions about home electrification. But if you've, if you've never used induction, some people say, oh yeah, I've used induction. But then I ask them a few questions, you know, they say, yeah, at an Airbnb or, or rental or something, they had, you know, induction, but actually it was just the old style electric cooktop that you know can take a while to heat up uh glows red hot you could burn yourself with it takes a while to cool down that's electric resistive so again work working pretty much just like a toaster you turn on the electricity and some wires or elements get hot um whereas induction is different it cooks with magnets so there's a, a magnet in these things and it uh, creates a, a magnetic induction field which basically turns the pot itself into the cooktop so you can and I did this at, at Glen Ira. Um, as soon as they were done cooking, they they took the pot off and I ran over and I put my hand right on the induction cooktop. And it was a little bit warm, but it, it wasn't going to burn me um, because really the induction is not terribly interested in heating up the glass or whatever that is. It just wants to heat up the pot. And once the pot was gone, well, then most of the heat was gone. So that's how efficient it is. It doesn't uh, waste energy trying to heat up glass and and that sort of thing. Now, it does mean that your pots need to be able to respond to a magnet. So if you get a fridge magnet, check the bottom of your pots to see if it's magnetic and, and then that'll be fine. Cast iron works, you know, many stainless steel work. Uh, some stainless steel don't work and aluminum doesn't work. So that's the the range of the, you know, ceramic, that's not going to going to work. You need something that uh, will respond to a magnet. That's the induction. Maybe there'll be some questions on that later okay probably getting pretty close to the end of the slides yeah this was the um the bit about monitoring your electricity use and particularly if you're using electric heater or if you think your fridge might be getting old uh, uh yeah that could be a good thing to plug into this power mate or power meter that i've got here 
plug the meter in the wall, plug the appliance into the meter, and then just let it run for a week. And you can see how much um, electricity you've used with that device. Uh, we already mentioned like the power pal, which is something that goes on your smart meter and then talks Bluetooth to the phone. Now in some apartment complexes or rentals, you won't be able to get that to work because where you are is too far away from the smart meter where the little device goes and so you, it won't transmit far enough or sometimes all the you know if it's a, a bunch of units or whatever sometimes the smart meters are all behind a lock and key and so then power pal will just say no no we're not going to come and install sorry um but if you are able to do it as uh rebecca was saying it is subsidized for the government so it's free now they they seem to have um a bit of a track record where they don't last forever uh, there's batteries in there, et cetera. So if you do get a power power, they have a competitor, it's called Emerald. So there's a couple of different options there. If you get one of those, use it a lot, get the information you can straight away um, in case connectivity problems develop between the, the meter and your phone, et cetera, with the Bluetooth and everything. And any other place where you can get some information, um, either your electricity supplier, such I've, I've mentioned PowerShop here has this heat map or your electricity distributor, which is probably United Energy throughout the Stonington area. They, they have uh, what are called web portals where you can log on there. You get the, you need the, the number, some numbers off your uh, electricity bill to log in. And there they have charts and graphs and things that will show you your electricity use down to the every half hour. Um, it's It gets uploaded like a day later. So if you keep track of what you did the day before, you can go look at um, these, web portals and they'll tell you what uh, how much electricity you were doing when you were doing all those things. Uh, that's the advantage of the power power, the emerald, if you get it, it can tell you instantaneously what's going on and you can go around and shut everything off and see how close to zero you can go. But uh, without a power pal, but if you had access to these web portals, you could still do that experiment over the course of a half hour um, and then go back later and see uh, when the data is uploaded as to uh, what you're able to accomplish in that half hour and shutting things off and understanding the impact of the, of the various appliances. Uh, and by the way, there's no smart gas meters, so you don't get this sort of information with gas. Oh, insulation, radio. And um, yeah, you mentioned like with that thermal imaging camera, you know, you might be able to open a manhole and get a ladder and see what's going on in your roof space. Uh, and hopefully it's not this, but it probably is because most of the properties I go into, this is what you see is someone will say, oh yeah, there's insulation. But the last person who went up there just, you know, threw it to the side to put in a cable or to chase a water leak or something. And so the insulation isn't where it's meant to be. So you could, uh, yeah, you, you just don't want to see any bare plaster. And here you can see there's a lot of bare plaster. So this is a, a disaster and should be fixed. And even if you took some photos, you know, you may be able to lobby a property manager to say, this is a de disaster, it needs to be fixed. And uh, if you have the thermal imaging camera, yeah, you can look at this from the other side as well. So like on a day when it's gonna be 34 degrees later, but it's still pretty cool at like 11 o'clock in the morning with the thermal imaging camera, you should be able to see the heat coming in. And so you may look at the ceiling and parts of it are you know 20 degrees and then hang on over here it's 30 degrees well that that's you know where there's no insulation and on the thermal imaging camera it'll show up really clearly that you've got um you know nice blue color where there's insulation and then it's red hot where there is no insulation so that's another dead giveaway and in the winter it could be the opposite that um that if you're running the heater and it's cold outside then um, you may be able to get a good image with the thermal imaging camera where the, the blue area is where you're losing heat in the winter time because there's no insulation. So if you have a roof space at all, and if you're able to get uh, do some kind of assessment like this, then you might have a case to go to property manager and say, look, this is kind of ridiculous, needs to be fixed. You know, not only from an energy saving point of view, but like a comfort point of view. If you have got bare plaster, on your ceiling and there's just like an ordinary tile or steel roof up there. Well, it's gonna be like having radiant electric heaters on your ceiling all summer long. So good luck being comfortable. I mean, if I had, you know, a radiant heater above my head here at 35 degrees, well, you know, that's not gonna be very comfortable or healthy. And uh, you know, what people might do then is turn on the air conditioner. And that's where you do get the big electricity bills from an air conditioner in the summer 
is because you're basically trying to defeat what are essentially radiant heaters on your ceiling. Insulation works. All you need to do is get a nice, perfect layer of insulation. And, uh, you know, that problem all goes away nicely. Um, this one's draft ceiling. And so there can be ways that you can do some draft ceiling without uh, a landlord or property manager getting too upset. Um, but as I talk about draft ceiling and sealing thing us up, we also have to have a conversation about air quality. And, um, you know, how do you get contaminants out of your house? How do you get fresh air coming in? How do you not have moisture problems? Um, you know, maybe the only thing bringing fresh air into the property right now is all the, the gaps and cracks, cracks around the place. So if we seal those up, then how are you going to get some fresh air coming in? In, in most cases, it's open a window. And uh, we do we do want to move from a, a situation where there's a lot of 24-7 all the time air leakage. And we'd rather move into a situation where we have managed ventilation and we manage ventilation by running the extraction fans and opening up the windows and getting some fresh air in that way and getting contaminants like the carbon dioxide that you breathe out out of the out of the building or moisture getting that out of the building. Um, but there can be some draft proofing you can do and a landlord's not going to get upset. I mentioned my daughter moved into a rental and uh, they had they had reorganized the bathroom in that rental. There had been like a laundry door, but that door couldn't be used anymore because a cabinet had been put up against the door. But there was like a, a vine growing right in through the door and into the bathroom. So we shifted the cabinet and uh, cut the vine away and sealed up the door so the vine's not coming back. I, I can't believe any landlord's going to get upset that there's no vines growing in through the doors anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, other things, like if you've got the, the wall vents up on the wall, it's possible to cut like a piece of core flute and to stick that up there even with blue tack to, um, or to uh, slow down the air leakage. And uh, that could be something that can be reversible. It's not going to damage the paint. Uh, all that said, you know, you do have to be careful sealing up wall vents or sealing anything up, particularly if you have gas heaters, because they could be producing carbon monoxide. And maybe the only thing keeping you alive is that the property is so drafty. So make sure the gas heater's checked and you've got a clean bill of health on the gas heater. It's not trying to kill you. Then you can start to seal things up. But um, but uh, focus focus also on the moisture. Um I've written, written an article about moisture management. One of the first things to do on moisture is to, to get hold of a, a device like this. So Rebecca, this might be even something that goes in the next round of the um, of the rental kits uh, or your <laughs> loaning out kits from the library. Yes, great idea. But, um, yeah, this, this has temperature down the bottom. It's uh, 18 degrees and relative humidity up the top, it's 49. And the best humidity, most healthy situation is if humidity is around 50%, maybe 40 to 60. But if it gets up into 70, 75, 80, then you're going to get mold problems. And uh, you don't want moisture to get that high. So this is 20 bucks off the internet. And, um, you know, if you're at 50, fine. But what we find is, you know, particularly in winter in Melbourne, some people don't, don't heat their properties that much. They don't... Uh, they don't open the windows that much and maybe the extraction fans really don't work that well or you don't even have any. You got to take a shower. There's all that moisture. It ends up going throughout the house uh, and then clothes drying. Um, if you hang clothes around the house to dry in the winter, that's going to dump a lot of moisture into a property or maybe the only clothes dryer you have is one of those so-called vented dryers, like one or two star dryers that just spit the moisture out at you. Um, yeah, you can't have that coming into a property or you're going to see this get up to 80%. Uh, you're going to get see in the winter day, you're going to see moisture on the on the windows condensing. And that's just too much moisture. So, um, so try not to hang laundry around the house in the winter with windows closed. Um, if you do get moisture on the windows, uh, wipe that up, get it down the drain, you know, wipe it up with a chamois cloth or a vacuum. They even have window vacuums these days that can suck all the water up get that down the drain. Um, my daughter went into this rental. Yeah, it was pretty dreadful through the winter, all the moisture on the windows. And she even got, you know, she had to throw my grandson's mattress away because there was some mold on there. Um, she ended up uh, borrowing my dehumidifier. So, um, you know, she was watching these things. She was wiping the water up. She was running the dehumidifier. She was running the reverse cycle air conditioner a little bit more to bring, you know, to at least warm the place up. 
uh, opening up the windows as she could. But yeah, they had a real moisture problem there. So um, there's a lot of a lot of properties like that in Melbourne. Um, yeah, I wrote an article on moisture management. Search my main name, you might see a few more hints there. So yeah, on the one hand, we want to draft proof and and stop the wind blowing through the house. But on the other hand, then we got to think about the moisture situation and you know crack some windows open from time to time to get the get the moisture out if there's um if it's in unavoidable that we're going to have that moisture in a property. That's a big to topic. I could probably talk for another hour on that alone. Um, let me see if I got anything else in the slides. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's like another... I mean, there's more sophisticated devices than this that you can get. And, you know, they can even talk to the, you know, the internet and the computer and you can get all sorts of charts and graphs. Uh, here's another one that I got from Ikea. This was 70 five bucks and not only does it do temperature and humidity but it also shows you like a uh, particulates from smoke so i use this to just confirm that my neighbors you know got a wood fire going and in that situation i'll, I'll close the windows because i don't like the smoke coming in uh because it's not good for you um so those are the fine particulates mm, but also you can see you know this could also show you you know if you've got a lot of fine unhealthy particulates coming as a result of the cooking and so what can you do about it? Can you, you know, get the extraction fan working better? Can you open some windows? Um, you know, if you have an air, if you have an opportunity to, you know, do a bit more barbecuing outside rather than inside, even air fryers can put out air pollution. Uh, and if you have an opportunity to do that outside on a balcony or something rather than inside can uh, improve the air quality. Uh, yeah, there we go. There's the, uh, the condensation issue with all the moisture on the windows which can lead to black spots on the windows, which is the mold that can be that can be cleaned up. Um, a bigger problem is where the mold actually gets uh, through the walls and then um, and then it's in the walls. In which case it can be a good idea to be draft proofing because if you've got mold in the walls, uh, you don't want the mold spores to be coming back at you through cracks and gaps, et cetera, in, in, the, uh, in the walls, uh, like even those wall vents. If we got wall vents in there, but there's mold back in there, well, you really don't want to be breathing the air that's coming at you out of those out of those walls. And so better that it be draft sealed and that you get fresh air coming in through the windows rather than coming in through walls where you don't know what's going on behind the walls. Uh, yeah, this this shows you a heat pump condensing clothes dryer. Um, Audi had one of these for 800 bucks, but other ones you might spend 1500. But these are seven to 10 stars. And they, uh, compared to the one or two star old style vented dryers, these can use like a third or a quarter of the electricity of the old style. They're very efficient. That's why they get seven to 10 stars. And they condense all the moisture into a bin, up, usually up on the upper left-hand corner that you can dump down the drain. So if you have the opportunity to um, use a heat pump condensing dryer that's one way to make sure the moisture is not getting out into the house um so that's a, a possibility so nothing to um nothing it uh, the only connection is that you plug it into the wall uh but one drawback is they're they're heavier than those old style dryers so they can't just be bolted up on a wall often you'll see the old style dryers bolted up on the wall they're too heavy for that. They either need to be on the floor or stacked on top of something sturdy, such as the uh, such as the front opening um, uh, washing machine. Uh, radio windows, windows. That's the other way. Um, you know, I guess summer's coming, so we're thinking about that. Although this is Melbourne, so we had winter today as well. So, <laughs> um, yeah, anything you can do to cover up the windows. Uh, in the winter to keep some heat in would be good. And then in the summer, you'd like to be uh, making sure that you don't have the direct sun hitting the windows or even reflecting reflected heat coming at you. A couple of things that renters can do. One is um, bubble wrap for the winter time in particular. Uh, again, my daughter's place at that rental, we went and bubble wrapped the windows because she had all the condensation on the windows from my grandson breathing. He's not gonna stop breathing. Uh, so you will have that moisture, but if you bubble wrap the windows, it's kind of like uh, double glazing in that it provides an insulating layer. And if you can keep the inside of 
you know, that plastic layer of plastic or pl layer of glass or whatever it is, if it stays warm enough, then it doesn't get below the dew point of water and then the water never condenses and then you never get the mold on the windows. So a uh, bubble wrap can keep you warmer, but also reduce that whole condensation problem on the windows and the mold problem on the windows. And there's a, another trick for, for um, summer. I don't think I have it on this slide. It's called a product called Renshade, R-E-N-S-H-A-D-E. Uh, keeps the heat out. It's aluminium, uh, perforated aluminium printed on paper. So you put it on the inside of the window with Velcro stickies. So that's all reversible uh, if you leave the property. But if you've got too much heat coming through a window, um, the Ren shade is a lifesaver. So even up here on the second floor where we are, you know, these windows later on will have Ren shade on them because we, we've got eaves. But uh, there's just too much heat comes in there. And the rent shade, it's like 150 bucks for a roll. I cut a bunch of bits that fit on the different windows. Oh, you can even see the, the Velcro stickies are still on the window there. Yeah. Um, so the Velcro stickies, they'll last for more than one year and uh, just put the rent shade back up. Uh, they're, it's perforated aluminum, still lets light through, enough light in the summertime, frankly. And uh, But with the perforations, I can actually look through it and, and recognize the person coming through the back gate. Um, so it, uh, it still gives you a bit of uh, visibility as to what's going on outside. Um, as does the, the bubble wrap, at least it lets some light in, but of course, if you had a nice view, you're not going to bubble wrap. But you might use the wren shade in summer if it's just, uh, just too desperate with the heat coming in. Oh, there we go. There's a picture of the wren shade. Okay, yeah. Um, up close, you can see what it looks like. And then the other one, those big windows have been treated with wren shade. You can see right through it and see the horizon. So that that would block a lot of heat. Um, I can imagine at that particular deck there, the deck was just getting blazingly hot, and so the wren shade would protect that that uh, property. Um, you know, if you get some blinds working inside, that'll stop some of the heat coming in. But of course, then you lose all the light. Um, if there are if there are any sort of blinds and awnings outside, use those to to stop the heat coming in as well, um, or maybe. You know, maybe buy a big sturdy umbrella that's not going to blow over the wind. That's something you could take with you if you left the property. But uh, a big umbrella that will stand up to the wind would uh, stop a lot of a lot of the heat, like warming up a deck, and then that reflects in through the windows. Uh, oh, just a little bit on water. Showers. Yeah, you may not be able to do much about your water heater, but you might be able to do something about your shower. Um you know, be looking to not be using any more than like nine liters a minute. That's a three star shower head, but there's even six star shower heads that only use four and a half liters a minute. Um, sometimes you can spin off the shower head you have and put your own shower head on there. That's what my another daughter of mine used to do. She had one of these super duper ultra low flow uh, and Kiri satin jet brand um, shower heads and she would take it with her wherever she went and then just put the landlords back on when you leave. But another thing you might be able to do if you can unscrew things is to buy like one of these $3 flow restrictors and put it in. So get a bucket, measure how much water you're using. You know, if you're at nine liters, that's not bad. Um, but, you know, I've measured shower heads using 50 liters a minute. And that's ridiculous. Um, you know, that's going to give you a big electricity or gas bill and plus a lot of a bigger water bill and a lot of water wastage. So you can do better than that. And sometimes the fix can be Fairly low cost, right? And the end. So that's it. Okay, I'll stop the share. Excellent, and thanks, uh, Tim. I'm just putting yeah. in the chat uh, about the subsidized shower heads too, and I've also put in about the draft ceiling. So sorry, shower heads. Bear with me for a minute. Uh, there was a question. Daphne was wondering where you get the Ren shade from. Yeah, from EcoMaster. I mean, you know, it's a bit of an Aussie story there. Someone, some Aussie invented the Ren shade actually down here in Cheltenham. And, um, you know, but then he was going to go bust. And the good folks at EcoMaster, Lynn and Morris Bionet, said it's a good product. It shouldn't disappear from the market. So they, you know, got the guy's equipment. And uh, yeah, so it's still in business, thank goodness. And you said that it makes like quite a noticeable difference for oh. you. Oh, my gosh. Oh, it's, it's, day, it's day and night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, even, you know, if it's going to be 40 degrees, it's it's still not enough. Um, you yeah. know, you'd want to have the eaves 
you'd want to have some internal blinds. It would be great. You know, these windows I have here, they don't, you know, it's second story. They don't have an accessible like pull down awning or anything. Um, yeah, on the hottest days, you want everything. But uh, yeah, you just put the rent shade up as a permanent feature for like the uh, four or five months through the summer there. Yeah, and I think really good for people who are in apartments and don't have access to any sort of external shading. Well, yeah, and even if you're not getting the direct sun, you get, you know, the closer, the more build up it is, you get heat radiating at, radiating at you from, you know, the neighbor's roof or the neighbor's bricks or whatever. Uh, that's something you can see really well with a thermal imaging camera. You know, you can use the thermal imaging camera inside your house and say it's hot in here, but then you say, where's this heat coming from? And you can go outside and, you know, measure the, the heat reflecting off your neighbor's bricks and it's, you know, the bricks are 55 degrees or something. You wonder why it's hot out there. Mm. Um, and I had a question. You spoke about the uh, reverse cycle air conditioners at the beginning of the presentation. What about like portable air um, air conditioners? What are they like in terms of efficiency? And Oh, they're, they're very poor. Um, use in emergency only, really. Yeah. So if you have um, no other option, basically. Yeah, if that's the only thing going to keep you alive. I mean, you can try the fans and you can try the, you know, the wet rag on your head and stuff like that. Um, what's an example? Friends of mine were having a dinner party and their air conditioner failed. So <laughs> you know, they're going ahead with the dinner party and they knew it was going to be hot. So they rustled up a portable air conditioner to get through the dinner party. But the reason they're so inefficient is that, um, you know, they're going to have this pipe that goes out the window. Um, you know, one, one thing I do, up here in another room is we've I've got an old not split system air conditioner. It's it's not reverse cycle. It's only cooling, but it's a you know one piece a box. You know you see them still see them in people's windows or or through the bricks through the wall. You know one piece heat exchanger. That was a, a not split system. That's what they had before they invented split systems. But we have one we pull out and we'll stick in a in a window for the summertime here. Um, so it, that's that's. It's not portable if my son's big and strong enough to come and grab it and stick it in the window. <laughs> but um, so that's one option. And then and there, you know, it's it's not a perfect fit in the window. So you have to, you know, put some cardboard there and mask off the rest of the window and, you know, hope it's not a security concern and all that. But the portables, they sit on the floor, but they'll have a pipe that goes out through the window. And when you turn it on, there's a lot of hot air generated by an air conditioner. And, you know, you're happy that's going out the window. Great. you got cold air coming out of one end and you have the hot air going out this pipe going out the window at a rate of knots. But then when you think about it, you think, hang on, this thing's blowing air out of my house. That means that somewhere else air is coming into your house because uh, you got to balance it. And so like if it's 40 degrees outside, great. The one space where you have the dinner party is cool. But, mm -hmm. you know, if there's 40 degree air being sucked into the house somewhere else, you know, through gaps and cracks and things that every house has, you know, under the front door or whatever. And so you go to the rest of the house and it will be hotter than it would have been if you hadn't used that air conditioner in the first place. So they're good for they're good, you're good for cooling off the spot that they're pointed at and really buggering everything else up. And and so that'll 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 cost you, you know, because later you'll go to those other bedrooms and what are you going to do, you know? Mm. so maybe just one bedroom while you're trying to sleep at night or something if using an emergency yeah if yeah. that's what it takes to get through then um then yeah it'll it'll heat up the rest of the the place where you're living but uh, if it cools off that room maybe that's how you survive mm. um claire was wondering if you had any tips on working with the body corporate who won't let the landlord install a air conditioner i'm assuming like a reverse cycle inbuilt air conditioner there oh um look maybe you can look through some of the paperwork of better renting uh for example but um um you know people you know the planet's getting hotter you know we got el nino coming uh and you really actually would want to address these things now you don't want to be you know even calling up an air conditioning person you know in this third day of a 40 degree heat wave because <laughs> they're going to be too busy anyhow the body corporates, I mean, you look around different property and sure, you know, every air conditioner is going to have this outside unit. And, um, you know, some people don't like the look of them and you do have to figure out where you're going to put them. And when you turn them on, they're going to make some noise. But that's that's kind of a fact of life these days. And if you look around, you'll see a lot of them around. And so you just have to ask the uh, think of, you know, is the body corporate being reasonable when you could, 
you could say, or you could even get, you know, some air conditioning people in to give you a quote. Um, and they'd say where they'd be putting this stuff and just, you know, try to assess, is it reasonable that they won't allow this piece of equipment to go in a certain spot? And I'd suggest, you know, it's, that's going to be seen as a very unreasonable position for the future for a people to survive the summer as they get hotter, but also be it for Melbourne to provide a, uh, you know, the cheapest and greenest source of, of heat in the wintertime. So um, they are kind of a lifesaver. And I think people are just going to have to get over it and figure out where they can install these things uh, rather than saying you can't install them at all. Yeah. And I think Claire, but I put I, in, Oh, sorry, Tim. I was just going to say, think you could find, I think you could find some support somewhere for making it happen. Uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see what, what councils do in the future along these lines. Yeah. I put in um, a link to Renew has a really great article on um, renter's guides to sustainable living. I'm quite sure in there they have tips about working with uh, body corporates and landlords. So have a look in that and hopefully that's a little bit of help. Yeah, you got, you got to find, you know, where does the equipment go on the inside of the house, on the outside of the house? Uh, and then also it's it's got to be wired in. So there will be electrical connections and there's costs associated with that. And, you know, it can be a little bit invasive, but look, it, it's the future. It's, a, it's, I don't know. Yeah, it's just something that's going to happen. They got to figure out a way to, to make it happen. It was kind of funny one time. I used to own a rental property in North Melbourne and it was on a, it was kind of on the ground floor. And even my kids lived there for a bit. And through the winter, like they really never needed any heat just because it was like in inside other buildings, et cetera. So it, it must have got some sun. So it didn't really need heat in the winter, surprisingly. Um, but it was a bit hot in the summer. As soon as I sold it, I drove by there and the guy had put a, a reverse cycle air conditioner on the balcony, which was was always in inevitable. It was always going to happen sometime. I was just looking as well. There's also Tenants Victoria that you can chat to and the Renters and Housing Union Victoria, who should also be able to give you some advice too. Uh, if there's any more questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, but otherwise, just wanted to say thank you so much, Tim, for your presentation tonight. I'm also going to put in a link to a survey. Uh, I would love you all to fill out. It's very short, I promise. I'm pretty sure there's only four questions. Um, and we just really like to hear feedback um, and any advice that you have for sort of future webinars like this. Um, yeah, and what you thought. So if you could fill that in, I'd be much appreciated. Um, I don't think there are any more questions at this point in time. I'm going to stop recording.